welcome to the worship service of the First Baptist Church of Marion, Illinois. Located just two blocks west of Tower Square near downtown Marion, this vibrant and energetic church meets weekly for high-energy, Christ-centered services. Enjoy the warm fellowship of the First Baptist family. We pray God's Spirit will be evident in our service and that you will want to come and see what First Baptist of Marion is all about. Rejoice in it. For nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once for the sins of many people. And he will appear again a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. Sing with me. Jesus. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus paid it all, all my sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow 
Lord Jesus, we thank you so much. Inhabit our praises this day as we bow before you. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for offering us this plan of salvation. Lord, on our own, we're nothing. Only through you and only through your grace can we come before you right now and call you Abba, Father. We thank you for that gift that you give us. We thank you for that wonderful gift of grace. We thank you for that promise that we can now say that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Father, let us remember this on the forefront of our minds. That this is why we are coming before you to praise you because you are worthy, because you are awesome, because you are loving, because you are God. We offer our praises to you, and in one accord, with one voice, we come together to give you glory. And we do it through the name of Christ. Amen. We want to welcome everybody to First Baptist Church. We are excited and overjoyed that you chose to join us for worship today. What we're going to do right now, we'd like to have everybody stand. We are going to fellowship together. And remember, we're doing it all for the glory of God.
and worship Him. Of Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walk Christ my Savior, weary and worn, facing for sinners, death on the cross, that He might save. Thank you so much guys you know I don't know that we understand the concept of what it means to have a Redeemer most of us have never been slaves or never had to been uh, bought out of uh, subjugation before and when I was just thinking about the the wealth of meaning in that word Redeemer he came for us he bought us back with his blood Praise God. Thank you for reminding us of that. All right, I need for you, all of you to do something. Turn to Mr. Index. 
Uh, Mr. Index's alias is Table of Contents, okay? Uh, but find that. It's your fr- he's your friend in your Bibles because I want you to look for the numbers. My numbers will mean nothing to you, but find the numbers, the page numbers, for the book of Jeremiah, the book of Daniel, and the book of Habakkuk. That's the one that has the most Ks in the name, okay? Habakkuk. So you find all those. And uh, you may say, well, why, Bob? It's because I'm going to visit each of those passages uh, uh, today. So you just go ahead and look for those because you're going to say, now, where's Habakkuk at? You know, it's in the Old Testament, as is Daniel and as is uh, Jeremiah. Uh, But I'm beginning a series on the book of Daniel this morning. And we're going to spend some time in that in the next few weeks as we uh, walk through that book. But I had a little bit of a problem before I could actually talk about verses 1 through 7. I was, I'll ask you the question, I asked Robin, uh, I'll ask you the question, what do you, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the book of Daniel? Well, you may think, you know, there's a lot of different things. You could say the lion's den. Matter of fact, Robin, uh, she sang me a little song. She asked, what are you preaching about? I said, well, I'm starting a series on the book of Daniel. And she began to sing, Daniel, 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 in the lie, 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 lie. Well, it's a lion's den. It's a, little, it's a little song that our kids learned when they were little. And that's what she thought of first. But how many of you thought of prayer first? Because the book of Daniel is about prayer. Daniel wanted to know. We have all the stories of Daniel. You know what got Daniel in the lion's den? Prayer. You know what got him out of the lion's den? God, who he had prayed to. So when we think about Daniel, what he actually was asking as we get toward the end of the book, he was asking God, what's going to happen to us? He had been reading in the book of Jeremiah, found out, that they were to be in captivity for 70 years. And it was getting closer to that 70-year time frame. And so he began to pray for his nation and ask God what is to come. And God began to tell him what is to come. But the nagging question that I felt like we needed to answer today is, Why did God allow his people to be taken out of the promised land that he gave them and into captivity and exile? Why? Because as I began to read in the book of Habakkuk and I began to read in the book of Jeremiah, as I told my Sunday school class today, I thought I was reading USA Today about America. Now, what I'm about to preach to you has nothing to do with politics, okay? Just get that out of your mind. I'm not preaching Democrat, Republican, Independent, nothing to do with that. What I'm talking to you about today is is that our nation is going in the wrong direction, okay? In a lot of the things that we're accepting, it has nothing to do with politics. It has everything to do with are we right with God Almighty. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about. And as you take a look at what was happening in Israel and in Judah just before we get to the book of Daniel, you're going to find out that what was happening there is not so far off of where we're heading today with the acceptance of sin on the television, on, 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 on and what we're reading, and, and in our very culture. The things that used to shock us don't shock us anymore. We are embracing sin And we're going to find today that just because it is lawful and we have the freedom to do what is not right in the eyes of God, we have the freedom to do right no matter what the law says. We have the right to choose freedom. It's been said by many people, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So I'm going to read the first four verses today out of the book of Daniel 1. And then we're going to take a walk through and answer the question, How did they get on the way to captivity? In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, 
came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Let's pray together. Father, speak through your messenger today. The words that were applicable in the days of Daniel, which are still applicable, applicable in the day in which we live. And Lord, it always calls us back to prayer. Lord, if we don't learn anything else from the book of Daniel, we learn that you and he had a very special relationship because he talked to you on a regular basis, but most of all, he listened and he let it affect his life. So Lord, you're calling us to live a special way in a troublesome time. And I pray, Father, that you will help us to be like Christ, that you would help us to, to be, Father, what you call us to be. Lord, we've got some things to stand up for. And I pray, Lord, that you will give us the courage, even if it means fiery furnaces, even if it means lion's dens, Lord, even if it means ridicule and laughter. Lord, our culture has turned away from you. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us to find our way back. And I pray, Lord, that as we study the book of Daniel, that you will speak to our hearts and let the prophets share with us, Father, how we can turn from our wicked ways and turn back to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me take you through just a very quick history lesson of what happened. We had Israel basically was divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And it's a little bit confusing because the northern kingdom was called Israel and the southern kingdom was called Judah. It's all called Israel now, but in that time, 10 of the 12 tribes decided they did not want to follow the descendants of David anymore, so they uh, established their uh, capital in Samaria, and that kingdom had about 19 kings over the next 208 years, none of them from the family of David, and none of them worshiping God alone. And that came after Solomon uh, uh, died. So the kingdom of Israel, the 10 northern tribes, were defeated by the Assyrians in 722 BC, and many Jews were taken into exile. The other thing that they did was they brought in Assyrians and people from other countries to that area and they began to intermarry with the Jews that were there. And that's where the Samaritans came from. When you get over in the New Testament and you talk about the Good Samaritan and you realize that they were prejudiced against the Samaritans, the reason was is because the northern kingdom was assimilated into the Assyrian culture and they were, uh, they, they didn't, uh, they weren't pure Jews. And so the pure Jews looked upon them as uh, someone to be prejudiced against. So it kind of gives you a little background there. Now the southern kingdom to the south had its capital in Jerusalem. They had the temple and this included two of the tribes, Judah and Benjamin. They had 19 kings that lasted for 344 years and all of them came from David's family. And even though, as I said, they had the temple and they had the capital at Jerusalem, they had a few kings that were okay, but most of the kings began to lead the people away from what God had taught them. And so in 586 BC, the Babylonians came in and conquered the people in Judah and took them to exile in Babylon, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and that's where we find ourselves as the book of Daniel begins. Now, turn with me to the book of Habakkuk. And uh, since Mr. Index has already told you what page number that's on, you find that because I want to take just a brief look here because Habakkuk is talking to God and look at verses uh, uh, 2 through 4. I'm going to be reading uh, from the New Living Translation because it's so very clear to the point I want to make today. But you follow along in your Bible. Basically, Habakkuk is saying what a lot of people are saying today from the uh, Christian standpoint. We're a mess today. 
You know, it doesn't take you very long to watch TV and understand that, that uh, you know, violence is on the upswing and, and has been for, for 25, 30 years. Violence is on the upswing. Uh, 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 going away from God, going away from worship, worshiping all sorts of things. I mean, did y'all hear last week that, that uh, there's a group wanting to put a statue of Satan in Texas? I mean, my goodness. You don't think idol worship happens today? We're moving in a bad direction, folks. And so Habakkuk, that was what was happening right before the Babylonians attacked. And basically, in my words, he said, God, things are a mess in our country. So look at verses 2 and 4. And here's what Habakkuk says to God. He's talking to God. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. And then God answers, okay. You want my, this is Bob's, uh, Bob's uh, uh, interpretation. Okay, you want my help? You want proof that I've never stopped listening? These obstinate people have ignored my protection, ignored my provisions, ignored my prophets and my personal attention, and I have a solution, and here it is. Correction through being conquered and taken into captivity. Habakkuk says this in verses 5 through 11. The Lord replied, here was his answer in scripture. Look around at the nations, look and be amazed for I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. I am raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. Their horses are swifter than cheetahs and fiercer than wolves at dust. Their charioteers charge from far away. Like eagles, they swoop down to devour their prey. On they come, all bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind, sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. They scoff at kings and princes and scorn all their fortresses. They simply pile ramps of earth against their walls and capture them. They sweep past like the wind and are gone. But they are deeply guilty for their own strength is their God. Basically, he is saying to them is, I am raising up some people to come and conquer you. And they're even worse than you are, if that could be possible. And I am about to bring judgment on the, my nation, my people. And what does that say to us today? If we are a nation, you know, we used to call, call ourselves uh, you know, the land of God. We used to call ourselves in God we trust, still on our, our, our currency. What if God said that to us? What if God has been saying to, that to us in the last 25 or 30 years with some things that have happened and, and, and attacks that have come and may be coming in the future? What if God is speaking to us and saying, turn, turn, turn from the direction you are going that leads you away from me. Habakkuk basically says, Lord, isn't that a little bit drastic? Look at verse 12 in Habakkuk 1. He says, oh Lord, my God, my holy one, you who are eternal, surely you do not plan to wipe us out. Oh Lord, our rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. Oh, by the way, do you know where Babylon is today? Well, you look that up, and, and you understand what area of the world we're talking about today when we speak of the Babylonians or Babylon. Notice it says in, in, uh, down in verse 16, it says, or 17 rather, it says, Will you let them get away with this forever? Will they succeed forever in their heartless conquest? And basically God says in verse Habakkuk, the second chapter in verse 4, Look at the proud. They trust in themselves, and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. And then down in verse 16, it says, but soon it will be your turn to be disgraced. Come drink and be exposed. Drink from the cup of the Lord's judgment, and all your glory will be turned to shame. They were on their way to captivity. They were first taken captive by sin, 
And then we find in the book of Daniel, they were taken captive by other sinners. Listen to that, folks. I need to repeat that because we're in, the, we're in the area of we're being taken captive by sin. We are embracing things today that 50 years ago, when, I mean, when I was a child, the things that we're allowing in our world today would just, it would have, it would have astounded them to think that some of the things that we say, oh yeah, that's okay, is allowed today and considered just as right as anything else. They were on their way to captivity. They were first taken captive by sin and now they will be taken captive by other sinners. Sometimes people have to be brought to the place where they have no other option than to look up for God's grace and mercy. It's drastic, yes, but if nothing else works, our God is willing to do the correction necessary to bring us back. Some will never come back. There's a song that uh, I used to sing oh, lots of years ago, and, and I think Chris, Christian uh, sang it first. But it was a song entitled, There's Light at the End of the Darkness. And the verses went like this. There's a light at the end of the darkness, and it shines for all the world to see. It will shine on your heart if you will let it. I was blind when it finally shined on me. There's a light at the end of the darkness. So look up when you are down and try to believe. Here's the point. Sometimes we have to be knocked down to make us look upward. I was looking up from the bottom when it finally shined on me. I pray, I pray that we don't have to be knocked down and look up from the bottom before we turn to God and, 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 and stop this downhill slide that we're going of accepting whatever comes. Well, let's take a look now at what was going on with, uh, with uh, Daniel. I have to go, don't, don't turn here, but let me just say to you, in Daniel 9, it says, and this is several years after the captivity and Daniel had been uh, uh, a wise man for several years. We find that Daniel says this, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Daniel was praying for his people. Daniel was very serious about praying for his nation. He was so serious he wouldn't stop praying for his nation even when he was thrown in the lion's den. He was serious, and I think we need to learn from Daniel today. So let's go back and take a look at what he learned from Jeremiah. So turn with me to Jeremiah, the 32nd chapter. Jeremiah, the 32nd chapter, and this is the prophecy concerning what happened to the nation of, of uh, Judah as the Babylonians came in. Jeremiah is saying, look, this is what's going to happen because God has told me this. In, in uh, Jeremiah, the 32nd chapter, verses 26 through 28, basically he's saying here, since you chose not to repent, correction is at hand. Then his message came to Jeremiah from the Lord. And this is what Daniel was reading. I am the Lord, the God of all the peoples of the world. Is anything too hard for me? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will hand this city over to the Babylonians and to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will capture it. The penalty for not repenting is correction. And I don't know what that will mean for us. I don't know what that will mean for all of the nations of the world, not just America, but other nations that, that uh, have been Christian in the past. But when we choose not to repent, God ups the ante, and he provides for us correction. He always provides restoration. We'll talk about that in a moment. But right now, we're looking at the prediction of destruction. In verse 29, 
he says the Babylonians outside the walls will come in and set fire to the city. They will burn down all these houses where the people provoke my anger by burning incense to Baal on the rooftops and pouring out liquid offerings to other gods. Basically what he's saying here is you are being corrected because you have believed in the wrong things and have ignored my truths which I have given you in the word. See Jeremiah was a prophet and Jeremiah had shared with them how they needed to repent, how they needed to change. All the way back to Solomon, we had the teaching of the Word of God, the Old Testament Scriptures, telling us how we should live. And they chose to believe wrong things. And then in verses 30 and 32, Israel and Judah have done nothing but wrong since their earliest days. They have infuriated me with all their evil deeds, says the Lord. From the time this city was built unto now, it has done nothing but anger me. So I am determined to determined to get rid of it. The sins of Israel and Judah, the sins of the people of Jerusalem, the kings, the officials, the priests, and the prophets have stirred up my anger. In other words, he's saying you are being corrected because your wrong beliefs have resulted in bad behavior. So, let me summarize for you. They did not repent when God told them how they needed to turn from their wicked ways and turn to God. They began believing in wrong things. And because they began believing in wrong things, those wrong things led to wrong and bad behavior. In verse 33, he says, My people have turned their backs on me and have refused to return, even though I diligently taught them. They would not receive instruction or obey. He ends this by saying, you are being corrected because you know better, but you refuse to do better. What about a nation who turns their back on God and refuses to return to his will and his ways? What about a nation who has more opportunities to learn God's word today than any nation that have ever existed before but refuses to receive instruction today? Do you realize that on my phone I have access to at least 20 Bibles? On my phone! In my office! I've got I don't even know how many Bibles, different translations that I have. I have a Bible program that has Greek, Hebrew, New Testament, Old Testament. I've got 26, access to 26 Bibles there. And I haven't spent a fortune to have that. I've collected them all of my life. Anybody in here could get a Bible. I know that because you come and ask me, I'll give you one. We have more access to the Word of God today than any nation, anywhere, at any time in, in the existence of mankind. Therefore, we have no excuse. We have no excuse for not knowing the right things to believe and to let the right beliefs change our bad behavior. From this, I think we can see what is important to God, and this is, this is, the, this is my point in the prediction of destruction. These things are important to God. It is important to God that we take him seriously. It is important to God that we believe right things. It is important to God that we believe, that rather we act right out of right belief. It is important to God for us to learn what is right. And it is important to God if we mess up to return to him immediately. That's the point of the prediction of destruction that Jeremiah shared. And that's what Daniel was reading about. I read a piece one time, and many of you I'm sure have read it. It said, all I really needed to know, I learned in kindergarten. Y'all ever read that? It's a pretty cool little book. I really felt bad when I read that because I didn't have kindergarten in the school I went to, so I didn't get to go. So I missed out on everything I really needed to know. But I did go to Sunday school. Matter of fact, my mother said, you know, I started taking you to Sunday school nine months before you were born. I carried you there myself. And you know what I learned in Sunday school? I learned the very thing that we have written on the wall out there in the vestibule. We have been called by God to love him. We have been called to love God. We have been called to love others. 
And we've been called to live the life that Jesus died on the cross to give us. And you know, Jesus summarized the entire Old Testament law. Love the Lord thy God with all, their, all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. Love others. And then you study all of the writings of Paul and the writings uh, of the gospel writers. And we learn that we are supposed to live a certain way. We are supposed to live loving God. See, what happened to them is they did not love God. They loved idols. They worshipped idols. They worshipped And you think, well, Bob, you know, I'm not worshipping an idol. Anything that leads you away from what God wants you to do is your idol, okay? Now, I know that's tough, but I'm, I gotta tell you this stuff, folks, because we're heading a bad direction, and we've gotta make our turn, and listen, the whole book of Daniel is about how some young men, especially the one, Daniel, lived a life pleasing to God in the midst of a culture that believed differently. And that's why this book is so important to us today. Yes, the prophecy is interesting. Yes, the lion's den story is, is neat in the fiery furnace, all that. But it's all about faith and standing up for what you believe and trusting God to do with you and protect you in the way that brings him the most glory. It's true, the promise of destruction is in our world's future. But something else I learned in Sunday school and we can miss the most horrible part of the world's destruction if we accept the gift of God and embrace the promise of restoration. Jeremiah 32, the second part of verse 36, shows us what God's desire is. You may think, well, what a bad God. Man, he, he brought the Babylonians in and let them override the, the Israel. Now, how could they do that? How, or the Assyrians with Israel and, and the Babylonians with the Judah. How could he allow that to happen? Because they wouldn't listen to him. And they kept going. They were even sacrificing children to the god Moloch. I don't have time to go into all the background, but they were even at the point they were sacrificing their very children. Take a look at some of the babies and children we have in our service today. Think about your grandsons and your granddaughters and your babies out there. And they were taking them to the altar and killing them for a god made out of stone and clay. And abortion's not too far off of that, folks. Because every abortion that happens today is a sacrifice to the God of convenience. I, you know, I really can't have a baby today. It's, it doesn't work into my lifestyle. It doesn't work in my, So it's not so far off today. So the promise of restoration is such good news. Look at verse 30, or 36. Actually, the second part of verse 36. But this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I will certainly bring my people back again from all the countries where I will scatter them in my fury. I will bring them back to this very city and let them live in peace and safety. They will be my people and I will be their God. Get this, God's desire is for his people to come back to him. Or if you've never come to him before, come to him now. Be restored. That's what he wants. He sent his son into this world to die on the cross so that you could be in relationship with him. See, we can't. And, and, and Dennis was talking about this earlier. We had to have the price of sin paid for us because we couldn't afford the price of sin. You can never live well enough. You can't be good enough. Well, if I come to church every Sunday, I'll go to heaven. No. You go to heaven by a relationship, knowing God through his son Jesus Christ in the power of his blessed Holy Spirit. And that's the gift. God promised them a gift in verse 39. Look at what uh, Jeremiah 32 says. And I will give them one heart and one purpose to worship me forever for their own good and for the good of all their descendants. One heart, one purpose, and that will be to worship God. That's the point. God wants us to be in relationship with him. He loves us and he created us to love him back. Is that hard? I mean, he's not asking us to climb Mount Everest. If he was asking us to climb Mount Everest, I wouldn't, I'd go to hell. I'd never make it. Sometimes I wonder if I make it up the stairs when I go home. I mean, I just wouldn't make it. I'd get about halfway and freeze to death. But God didn't set all these things that I had to do. What he set was, you accept my son. And by grace, 
he basically said, we are saved by grace through faith. That not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then once I have the power of God in me, then he helps me to live the life. I can't live the life apart from his power, apart from his glory, apart from his mercy. You receive God, you receive his power. Will I be perfect? No, I will never be perfect. But I have perfection living in me. You know, I don't pray anymore for for God help me do my best. I pray, God, do your best through me. Because my best falls short, always. He will give us a gift, one heart, one purpose, and that's to worship God. He said it's for your own good, and it's for the good of all your promise, uh, or, or, uh, sorry to use a colloquialism, but, but for all your kinfolk too, all of your descendants, all of them that are coming, this is going to be good. I'm going to give you one heart and one purpose to worship me, and it'll be good. And then he says in verse 40 and 42 of Jeremiah 32, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them, and I will never stop doing good for them. He's talking about Jesus, folks. He's talking about the new covenant that Jesus made at the Lord's Supper. He says, I, Lord's Supper, I'm establishing a new covenant with me. On the cross, my body is going to be broken. My, uh, my blood is going to be shed. And when you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. Uh, you come to the Father through the Son. Listen to what he says. I will never stop doing good for them. I will put a desire in their hearts to worship me. They will never leave me. I will find joy doing good for them and will faithfully and wholeheartedly replant them in this land. This is what the Lord says. Just as I have brought all these calamities on them, so I will do all the good I have promised them. That's the promise. How do we find heaven on earth? The same way We will in the afterlife through our relationship with God, through Christ. I ask you today, have you been away? God's desire is for you to come back. Have you ever received the free gift God wants to give you? The wages of sin is death, it says in Romans 6, 23. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's giving it to you as a gift today. Are you the kind of person God receives joy from as he does good to you and through you? Philippians 2.13 says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. You can be restored today. We all can be restored to a new commitment, to a new uh, motivation to want to live right. And we're going to learn a lot of things from Daniel about how to do that. But the most important thing that we need to learn to do to learn today is that regardless of how stained our life is, God can make a wonderful picture out of that stain. The Bible says that God works all things together for good to those who love the Lord. In Romans 8, 28, to those who are called according to his purposes. Chuck Swindoll tells a story about a a mansion in, uh, I believe it was in Spain. And one of the servants was getting ready to pour something and 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 as she was pouring this she tripped and and got a stain all over a brand new wall that had been uh had been had had a uh, something on it that was just beautiful worth thousands thousands of dollars well just so happened that there was an a famous artist by the name of uh landseer i think was his name yeah landseer Lord Landseer just happened to be there. And while the family went out to kind of get over it, he walked over there with charcoal and he took that stain and he made a masterpiece out of it. And to remember what he did, any great artist that ever came into that house was given some charcoal and said, now add to it. And if you were to go to the house today, if it's still around, you would find that they had made a beautiful tapestry and it all started with the stain. Your life, my friends, is a, can be a beautiful tapestry. You may think, no, it's too stained. My life is too bad. I could never be good enough for God to love me and use me. That is not true. He wants to take you and love you. There is hope in the master's touch. Another old song says, shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me. I am no longer the same. He touched me. Oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me. 
and made me whole. There is hope in the master's touch. He's in the restoration business just like this artist was. Well, to sum up, the prediction of destruction was fulfilled. And when we go back next week and we take a look at the life of Daniel, it will be in the captivity that they were on the road to. And now we're going to see what it's like to live a godly life in captivity. But the promise of restoration was in place even before the fall occurred. The entire book of Daniel could be summarized in loving God, loving others, and living the life that Jesus died on the cross to give us. In Daniel's day, it was living the life that God had taught them in his word. No one has to stay on the road to captivity because we have someone who wants to take us off of that road and put it on his road, and that's called repentance, turning from our way to his way. What do we learn from Daniel? Well, maybe we learn from Daniel that we need to focus on prayer. First of all, we need to pray for ourselves. We're going to open up the altar here in just a minute. I'm going to give you the pre-invitation now. We're going to open up the altar, and maybe some of you will be called to pray, first of all, that you will get serious about praying every day for our world, specifically our nation, our state, our community that we live in and that you will take a little bit of time every single day and pray that we will seek your face again you want second chronicles seven fourteen is a good a good place to pray and just pray but 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 before you do that pray that god will turn you to be on his way and that you will turn to the life that he wants you to be on would you bow your heads with me please Father, I come to you today thanking you for the people that are here. Father, there may be some here that need to come to this altar and are being called by you to come to this altar to pray for our nation, to pray for ourselves, that we would turn and be doing the things that you want us to do. Lord, sometimes I get a little afraid when I see us worshiping things that are not you. Father, sometimes I get a little afraid when I'm not appalled by some things that I see because I've been desynthesized. I don't want to be, Lord. I want to know what you know, and I want to love the things you love and, and hate the sins that you hate, but always love the people that you love. Father, please help us as we begin this year, Lord. Uh, we're a couple of Sundays into it, and I just pray as we begin to make our commitments for 2014 that we will pray that we will be the Daniels of our day, that we will stand for what is right, even when it's not popular, that we will stand for the truth of the word of God, even when people may persecute us. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will call us and the ones that are listening on television to prayer, to pray, Father, that we can be the Daniels of our day. Lord, we love you. We thank you. If there's someone here that doesn't know you, that doesn't have that promise of restoration, I pray, Lord, that you would help them right now to come and receive it. In Jesus' name, amen.